Nashville, Tennessee is home to some of the world's finest musicians. From country music to R&B to hip-hop and everything in between, if you've heard it, Nashville's got it. But ever since I moved to the city in 2013, I've met some incredible musicians who fall in between the cracks. Amazing musicians who are passionate about that other music. So I'm not here to talk about the music you've probably heard. I'm here to introduce you to them, illuminate their music, and share their stories. My name is David Rogers. I'm an improviser, composer, and pianist here in Music City, USA. And I want to welcome you to the Improviser's Corner. On today's episode, we chat with keyboardist Paul Horton, whom you may know from the Nashville band Concurrence. We chat about his roots and influences, and fun fact, we discovered that he was family friends with Thelonious Monk. I, I sit down and I do play with the thought that if this is the last time I'm playing, <laughs> like, I know a lot of people say that, but it is a good exercise that you're not going to, regardless if you are sick, but you made it to the gig or you're injured in some way, I'm going to play like this is it. Have you always been that way? I had, a, I had a piano teacher who used to tell me, play like your life depended on it. That really resonated with me. Um, I've tried to use those words for peers in the past and people have told me that's just too intense. I tried to go there and I couldn't do that. I was at MTSU for like two years, so I, I left um, after two years and moved back to Alabama. And as I started to play more right before we moved back, I started to just take on that. I don't, I don't know if I heard it on an interview, probably like NPR. They had that slot of shows that I used to listen to all the time. Na Nancy Wilson's Jazz Profiles and Live from Lincoln Center. And it was probably one of those interviews um, because I can't remember an actual person saying that to me in real life. And it sh that coincided with me and uh, Greg forming concurrence. It was around the same time. And I, that is what kind of got me back to, I got back in touch with what it was I loved about music again. I was married and living in North Alabama, working at the music store, working as a security guard on third shift. Um, I was I worked in construction, putting in ceramic tile floors and backsplashes and all that, and um, not playing much music. And Greg, who that first year he was a journalism major, he and I met one day in the practice rooms at MTSU that first semester there in 2000. And him and a friend of ours, Andy Ray, who's a drummer who was studying uh, Spanish. He was a Spanish major. They would they were sneaking into the music rooms because he was taking some music. Andy was taking some music classes, and they would play. And that was the first time we met. And then, right across from the MTSU, there used to be this pizza shop. They would just let us come in there, like y'all want to play, just play whatever. Me, Greg, Andy, um, sometimes Neoshi Jackson. We just start playing. We do standards. We do free stuff. Greg's the first person that I actually played freely with in in a, in a live setting. Nashville. Uh, my friend Willie has a little Korg D10, I think those little blue yeah. they sell. Uh -huh. He's like, man, you need to come over here and let's, let's do some recording. So that was like the first concurrence meeting and we just fully improvised the stuff, printed up some CDs and he called me again. He's like, I'm going to be in town. We need to play a show up here. So I'd move, I'd drive up there 
and do recording, do a show. And then my wife's job transferred into Nashville. There are a lot of places that aren't around anymore we used to play, but just me and him, just duo stuff, just improvise off the off the head. Some nights it was really great, a lot of fun. Some nights it was like, okay, that tune, that space of time, we really got somewhere at this other space. It's interesting how, you know, especially in a duo setting, which is very intimate, you know, it's you and one other person, yeah. you know, and especially if it's the same person, you start to develop just like in a conversation, oh, yeah. a feel and a, and a relationship with that person. Yeah, when we were doing duo, it the the challenge, was just like playing in places where like there may not be so many people pre YouTube was just like allowed us to just like not really not worry about messing up. Being you Realizing that you have limitations, realizing that you may not be where you want to be musically and from a technical standpoint, from vocabulary, maybe you don't like the way you write right now, but um, just being happy and just knowing that, okay, I'm going to do this now, I'm going to do my best and know that I can grow and evolve and get better no matter where you are. For me, I've always tried to figure out how much do you teach, how much do you show explicitly, and how much space do you leave? Like, how much room do you leave for the person? It's very much like playing duo. Yeah. You know, it's like, how much do you say and how much do you not say? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I gave someone a lesson which I very rarely do because of that very reason that you just but I was telling him about how a teacher told me that um, it's best if you when you're comping and doing chords that you stay in this particular area of the keyboard and I was me coming from someone who was like grew up on like hard silver people who like existed down here a little bit more it, it just really didn't make sense to me and that was just like one little conversation one day my mom she is the one who had me and my sister start piano lessons we were young eight music lessons and then classical stuff when I was like 11 12 and then when I was 14 15 I really got into her jazz collection um, and so then she was like well I know someone in Muscle Shoals which was like 40 minutes away who can teach you like jazz harmony concepts and stuff and so she would drive me to Muscle Shows. I'd have the lesson. And so Pete Avalon, he was the teacher, and he was very, very good. He was like, yeah, just, you know, just experiment with this, try this. Don't feel like you have to do this here, but like, check this out, you might like it. And one thing that my mom was adamant about, this was like in the 90s, whatever your right hand can do, you need to train your left hand to do it. She, that, like, it was constant that she would tell me that.
but my folks, uh, my mom's folks and family were very close to the monk family. Like she knew all the monks, she would see them. And every year growing up, we used to get these invites to the monk annual dinner. And it wasn't until I was like 17 and 18 that I realized, is this, this is like the monk month? She's like, yeah, yeah. And all this time we could have been <laughs> going out there and hanging out with T.S. Monk. And there's like, oh yeah, Peanut. Pe peanut, yeah, that's T.S. It was nice as neat. I'm like, mom holding out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she would tell me stories about going to the village gate and seeing like Horace Silver and Joe Henderson. And Don Alico actually was one of the teachers that one day we were at. Uh, I always think about this day. It was in an ensemble class that he was conducting. It was like me and Marcus and um, a bass player named Adam Bond. I was playing Stella, and everybody was, I think we were supposed to take two or three choruses or something. And like at the end of my chorus, Don like starts yelling at me, like, you need to keep going. And so I kept going. And then the next chorus, like, you keep, you got more to say. And so that. And he would encourage me, like that day, I remember him talking to me about, check this out, work on this, I like your sound, you remind me of such and such player, have you checked them out? Yeah, Don, Don, is, um, Don is one of those teachers. I hope to this year get like a project started investigating like the history of Jefferson Street. I have thoughts about what um, I-40 coming through Jefferson and changing that culture. In an alternate reality, if they hadn't done that, what would Jefferson Street have, you know, done to the Nashville community now? This is all just imagining but I feel like if Jefferson had been left to blossom and continue to grow, it wouldn't be just known at this point in time if they had left it alone for country music. And, you know, if you look at like Los Angeles and the, the beat scene and what they were doing at Low in Theory with Stones Throw People and Flying Lotus and how that scene influenced music and what trap music in Atlanta and having that scene influenced popular music. I just wonder what could have been <laughs> if I-40 hadn't cut through, shut down the venues, because up until recently, I wasn't aware that I knew there were some venues down there, and I knew there was a scene back in the day, but I didn't realize how, how big and um, it was really quite active. Concurrence did a show, we inter Greg interviewed one of the musicians who was a session player on the day. He's still a session player, I forget his name. But he would talk about how there were several clubs. You could catch Cannonball Adderley one night and Ray Charles and James Brown, all on Jefferson Street. Having him regale stories about that time. And That's almost scenes. hard to imagine now I, that that could ever have existed. Part of my, one of my goals for 2019 is to, to start on um, some research on Jefferson Street's history. There's quite a few of those session players still live here. There's even a Jefferson Street museum there on Jefferson Street that a guy runs in his spare time. The geography or the city layout affects the music culture of cities. I mean, that's a whole conversation. But you look, you mentioned Los Angeles, you look at LA, you look at New York, and the fact that commute time in Nashville at the right hours, right. you can still get across the city in 20 right. minutes or so. Like that ease of transportation allows people to do everything from a yeah. musical perspective. You know, you can pick up three gigs in a night. The flip side of that is that those little niches don't ever really get a chance to develop as much as say New York or LA. I think just because, you know, people are not forced to 
stay in one location. They have that ease of, they have that accessibility. And I think that's both a pro and a con, or a contributing factor to Nashville, why it's sort of this, it's music city and it's lots of different types of music, but only a few of those types of music actually have real historical roots. Right. Still obsessed with film soundtracks. I used to like record credits with my little cassette recorder, and and then hip hop because like MTV and BT and VH1 in the '90s it was like so that those are my three things: film music, improvised music, and hip hop. My mom also, she was really into Cuban music. She had a lot of Afro-Cuban records, so that was another interest of mine. But when I got to school, uh, a friend of Yolis. Uh, Christy Burkeen got me hip to Bjork in 2000, and like Vespertine is like a top five record for me. So that record like changed the way I thought about a lot of things. Uh, my wife is just a very optimistic person. That definitely started to change the way that I write because she and I would just have conversation, long talks about just the existence. And, um, and then the kids come along. And so that is just like a, an injection of um, hope. And then also just watching them learn. They're being creative. And then you think about, you know, how can I get, get into a place of wonder like they are when you're writing. Just in terms of balancing out like practice time and uh, family time, real realizing that balance is a good thing. <laughs> like to to play music and to play it well, to achieve some of the things that I want to achieve on the piano, just from a, a, a musical standpoint, technical standpoint, it does require sacrifice. <laughs> there is you you do have to sacrifice some things. Something has to to give. So I'm sacrificing uh, sleep. They've just taught me like, just, you can still, you know, you have to sacrifice something, but just have balance. Like balance is like the key. In the balance, you do focus and your intention, they become clearer like, you don't want to waste time messing around on um, stuff that you're already good at, you know, so um, it helps to focus on your weak points. Thank <laughs> you.